America, bringing us YouTube, MacBooks, McDonald's, and all the wonders of brands that we really enjoy. And on top of that, as investors, they've brought us the S&P 500, which over the past 100 years has produced some pretty amazing results. And it's become a global benchmark for many to beat. And whether or not you're a stock picker or you're an index investor, I think US-based stocks has become such a large component for quite a few portfolios out there. However, you might have noticed some of the bleaker headlines that have been coming up and you might be feeling a little bit nervous and wondering about what to do. Well, you're in luck because in this video, I'll be sharing with you why you might want to consider reducing some of that US-based exposure and on top of that, how to diversify, not just from my opinion, but thanks to a piece of research done by Morningstar. Hey guys, it's Sunmin and welcome back to Your Money Game, the show where we'll save, invest and feel better about money. So the biggest reason that's cited by most people right now is valuation. It is simply the logic that the US-based markets have become really expensive. So let's face it, even if you have something that's good, it is possible to pay too much for it. For example, I'm not gonna pay a scalper $2,000 for a PS5 when the retail price is $750. Jokes aside, let's walk through a couple of the famous valuations and what they're telling us about the markets right now. Let's start with the biggest hero of the investing world, Warren Buffett, Buffet Buffett. He's got his very own indicator called the Buffett Indicator and it's simply a ratio between the total market capitalization, which is the value of all the companies in the US combined, divided by gross domestic product, which is GDP. It's currently at an all-time high of 204%, which is even higher than it was back in the 2000 tech bubble. And then there's another commonly used valuation method where you use price divided by the earnings. And there's a version of it called the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. And it points to the same conclusion that the S&P 500 is pretty overvalued. And just for good measure, I've looked up a bunch of other indicators as well that people were using. And again, the long story short is they all point to the same conclusion. And in case you were wondering, does this all mean it's, heck, it's doom and gloom and markets are gonna crash absolutely tomorrow? No, that's not what these indicators are trying to tell us. Just remember that markets can stay overvalued for really long periods. Because remember that even though the prices might not really crash, earnings can eventually catch up in theory. What it's telling us is simply to expect lower average returns in the years moving forward because again it's expensive right now so therefore don't expect to have a lot of big gains when it comes to the markets moving forward but it might be prudent for us to start thinking about how do you maybe protect your portfolio or diversify it a little bit in the event that it could happen and the main reason behind that is this term called correlation so most people understand the basic logic behind diversification. It simply means like, don't have all your eggs in one basket, right? Unfortunately, if all your assets are very highly correlated, it's as if that you are getting all these eggs and getting all these baskets, and you're giving it to one guy while he's running. If he trips and falls, odds are high that quite a lot of those baskets and those eggs will basically break. Now, let me show you a likely example using a free online tool which you could use as well called Portfolio Visualizer. Say you're a big believer in America and you have the S&P 500 as well as the Nasdaq ETFs, so you own SPY as well as QQQ. A common inclusion to a portfolio like this is to own something like the VEU, which is the Total World XUSA ETF. And a lot of people think, yeah, yeah, wow, I get to own all the stocks around the world minus USA. And that really kind of makes my portfolio quite complete. But unfortunately, a quick look using the portfolio visualizer tool will show you that the correlation between these assets are all pretty high over the past decade. So as you can see, the SPY, QQQ and VEU are all quite highly correlated. 
What's also a high correlation is that if you click on the like and subscribe button, YouTube will share this video out with more people and it really helps my channel grow. Thanks. So now let's get to that juicy research paper which I mentioned earlier, done by Morningstar. And if you're interested in reading a bit more, I've attached a link to it in the description below as well. Now the report goes into much more detail, but I'm just going to use one simple table that they produce, which I think we can extract a few key points from. This simple table measures how did various assets perform during different crises over the past 20 plus years. So the first point that you can see is that different assets perform differently during different crises. For example, commodities did pretty well during the tech bubble when it burst, but it didn't fare so well when it comes to the other crises as well. Second is that even though they are correlated, it doesn't mean that prices will move in the exact same pace or the exact same amount. Again, with the commodities, you can see that it's correlated because it's moving down alongside with the US stock market, but it's not moving necessarily at the exact same pace or amount. Finally, there's some obvious winners here, which are US treasuries and gold, which you can see have really protected quite a lot of the portfolio during the crises in the past. If you wanted gold, you can easily access it through an ETF like GLD. For the US-based treasuries in the research, they are specifically 5-10 to 10 year treasuries, so you can buy that through an ETF called IMTB. Or, if you wanted to, you can buy a total US bond fund, BND, which moves fairly in the same way. So that's the research-backed view. And again, a simple YouTuber like me, I'm not going to argue with it. But in my personal portfolio, there are a few different things that I'm trying to do as well, which I'd like to share with you guys. The principle isn't just about being defensive, but also diversifying into other growth opportunities that you might be able to find that are also less correlated. Let's start with China. Now I've done a couple of videos on the country before and my base case hasn't really changed so you can check it out if you're interested. But the broad conclusion is that people are also very under allocated towards China considering the size of their influence as well as the size of their economy in the global GDP. The two funds that I own are CNYA as well as KWEB and the truth is 2021 has not been kind to the Chinese markets. Uh, CNYA is up barely 5% compared to the S&P 500, which is already about 12, 13% or something. And for KWEB, it's worse because it's actually down about 8% for the year. So it's taken a really big hit. Both these ETFs have a considerably lower correlation to the S&P 500. You can read that as maybe they won't be impacted so badly as well if the US markets start to crash. Or you can interpret it in your head as buying those assets at an already discounted price. The next is to consider emerging markets. In my previous video, I mentioned that I'm holding on to IEMG, but since then I've just swapped it out for AVEM, which covers the same region but the composition is slightly different. Unfortunately, the correlation is still pretty high when it comes to the S&P 500. However, I'm still banking on the fact that it is a underinvested or underallocated region and it's because research shows that the region accounts for 40% of global GDP but the current estimates of ownership is only about 8%. The final one that you can consider researching further are commodities. But hold up, didn't we already talk about that earlier in the Morningstar research? The thing is, there are many types of commodities out there and what you saw earlier was a basket of commodities. And if you think about it, gold is also considered a commodity and look how it fed during those crises. A couple more interesting ones that you could look into are copper and silver, both having fairly low correlation with the S&P 500. And on top of that, there's a positive narrative about both those metals doing well because of the green revolution. As a disclaimer, I do own a basket of commodities through PDBC. I own a little bit of gold through GLD, as well as some silver through SIVR. Regardless, 
Everything that I've mentioned here are really just for illustration and examples only. If you are interested, I really encourage you to do your own research. Use that portfolio visualizer tool. Again, I've got a link in the description below so you can just check it out. And if you find some interesting options to diversify that are also low correlated and are also growth oriented, hey, let me know in the comments below and we can talk about it. So thanks for watching. I hope you got some value out of this. And if you did, I would appreciate your support in clicking that like, sub, as well as that bell button because I'll be back again next Sunday with a brand new video. And until then, you take care and keep playing your own game.